who is a doctoral candidate at the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at you know, Indiana University, to the Zichin Kunchabling Cultural Center, and especially our library here, is hosting his talk on a very fascinating part of the Silk Road, which is the Takla Makong Desert. It's been a crossroads of cultures for um, millennia, and there are there some very fascinating shrines that have elements of ancient Buddhist as well as pre-Buddhist uh, traditions mixed together with uh, contemporary Muslim uh, uh, religion. In addition, it's a political hotspot. It's a place that we often read about in the newspapers now. The Ouija people have a very uh, long and proud history, and it's all very fascinating. So we'd like to welcome uh, Michael Evans to tell us about mysterious shrines of the Taklamakan Desert. Welcome. Eric, and thank you very much for having me here. Um, I was going to include a lot more pictures on this presentation. I have included pictures that I took myself, and then I have this wonderful coffee table book of the living shrines of the Taklamakan, and I decided I didn't want to take pictures of it and post them into my uh, PowerPoint, so I am going to pass around this book and you can take some picture or you can uh, take a look at some of the places that I'm talking about um, when I talk about that. Uh, now I'm going to have to apologize that this isn't exactly my uh, area of expertise, not the religion or the ancient history of, uh, of Xinjiang. Um, the Taklamakan Desert is located in the region of Xinjiang. Uh, my my uh, research interest is really in contemporary Uyghur history. So um, this is just something that I thought might be of interest uh, here at uh, the the temple, the uh, Lama Temple. So um, and I'm going to build do a lot of build up for not a whole lot of. Um, known facts, just suspicions about a common history um, behind the shrines like this in Xinjiang and the prayer flags that you would see in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Okay, so you've heard me say a couple of times, China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region it's located in China's far northwest corner. It has it's a land area of about 1.6 million square kilometers. It's China's largest uh, provincial level unit, uh, closely followed by Tibet to its south and Inner Mongolia to its east. Xinjiang has a um, it shares borders with. Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all the Central Asian stands, uh, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Uh, here's just a, a road map that I've collected uh, of Xinjiang, uh, just to give you an idea of the layout of the land. Um, you notice that along the sides, there's a lot of stuff. In the middle here, there's not a whole lot. The same is true in the north. There's a lot on the sides, not a lot in the middle. Both of these are massive deserts. Uh, in the south, the Taklamakan Desert, uh, and in the north, uh, it's not important. <laughs> uh, Xinjiang is separated by mountains. There are mountains all throughout here. It divides it into three different uh, regions. To the east is the Turpan Depression, which is one of the lowest spots in uh, one of the lowest spots in the world, uh, one of the lowest spots in China. <clears throat> to the north is the Dungarian Basin, which is a uh, steppe land, and then to the south 
is the Tarim Basin. And we're going to focus mostly on the Tarim Basin. I'm not going to say a lot about the Turpan Depression. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Zungarian Basin. Uh, but these three regions are all part of what makes up contemporary Xinjiang. And just for visualization, this is a great map that I found on Wikipedia. Uh, to the north, we have the Zungarian Basin, the Turpan Depression, and the uh, Tarim Basin. Okay. Um, one of the most complicated things when talking about a place such as Xinjiang, or for that matter, Tibet, or Inner Mongolia, is how do we define China? Uh, China is a very complicated term. You might not think this if you're not familiar with what contemporary China is, uh, but it's very complicated. <laughs> the first character in China is Zhong, uh, meaning the center or middle. The second character is Guo, meaning country or state or kingdom. This has led people in the past to say that Zhongguo meant the middle, middle kingdom. Zhongguo is the contemporary word that we use for China. And a lot of people would say that that means middle kingdom. It really means something different, though, when you're talking about China before 1912. In 1912, you have a Republican revolution that overthrows a foreign uh, rulership of China, the Manchu Qing Empire. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, before 1912, you don't have a single place that you would call China, or at least when you see Zhongguo, uh, before 1912, it has a completely different meaning than the contemporary idea of a nation state. The nation state is a very new construct. So I'm going to show you what it constitutes, what historically constituted China. China is historically rooted around two major rivers. It's the Yellow River, which runs roughly like that, and the Yangtze River further south that runs towards the center. So you notice the first historical dynasty, the Shang Dynasty, uh, it has an area that's surrounded, or that's mostly around the Yellow River. When we go to the Zhou Dynasty, which um, the subsequent dynasty, you notice it, it has a little wider area, but once again, it's centered around the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. We go to the first historical empire. If you've ever seen the movie Hero, I guess, the movie Hero, um, this is the Qin Empire, and this is the, word, this is the empire that we get the word China from. Uh, once again, to the north, there's the Great Wall. Then, once again, you're surrounded by the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. Things are getting a little bit bigger by the Han Dynasty, um, but still the center of uh, the center of what we would call Zhongguo, the center the center state, would be along the Yangtze River and the Yang, uh, the, the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. It goes there's this little corridor here that allowed for um, trade <laughs> up to the border, basically of contemporary Xinjiang. The Tang Dynasty in the 7th century, uh, at its greatest extent, um, now this, this wasn't the entire Tang Dynasty, but for, for its greatest extent, it did stretch into contemporary Xinjiang. But once again, the core of China, the Zhongguo, was in, along the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. Once again, it's after the Tang, Tang Dynasty, then you have the Song Dynasty. The Song Dynasty uh, along the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. Then something happens in the 13th century. 
and that would be the Mongol conquest. The Mongols come from this northern steppe land. They conquer China as well as much of the rest of Asia and as far west as Eastern Europe. So during this time, China, Zhongguo, was uh, considered the Yuan Empire. Uh, but this is not a Chinese empire. This is a Mongolian empire. After the Mongols, uh, after their state quickly collapsed, then once again, China returned, Zhongguo returned to its original borders, uh, or roughly the same borders along the, uh, the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. Once again, uh, 17th century, uh, China was conquered by an outside power, the Manchus. Manchus conquered uh, China as well as Mongolia and these western regions, uh, Xinjiang, contemporary Xinjiang and Tibet, um, and created the Qing Empire. This was China's last historical empire. You notice that it goes until 1912. Up until this point, we have a central, we have a central area of China, the Middle Kingdom, if you want to call it that. I prefer to call it the Central States. <clears throat> so if we look at contemporary China, um, before 1912, Zhongguo would mean the central states. After 1912, we consider it China, because after 1912, then they started having the semblance of a Chinese nation state. Okay, so I talk about the complications in talking about China. Can't talk about China before 1912 because China did not exist. There was the central states before 1912. After 1912, then you have the modern nation state of China. You have similar problems with the English word for Chinese. Chinese can refer to the Chinese language, a citizen of the Chinese state, or a person who is ethnically Chinese. You can say that someone's a Chinese citizen, but their first language is not Chinese. You have Chinese citizens who are native speakers of, of Tibetan, or Mongolian, or Korean, or Uyghur. All of these are Chinese citizens, but they're not ethnically Chinese. There's also a really problematic word sometimes used in China called uh, it's Zhongguohua, which means the language of China, which it's, it's a real problem because what they're talking about with Zhongguohua is Chinese, what we know as Mandarin Chinese. Uh, the problem with saying that is that China is also the home of Tibetans who speak Tibetan. It's also the home of Uyghurs who speak Uyghur, Mongolians who speak Mongolian. So in, in Chinese, it's a little bit less ambiguous, despite that Zhongguohua problem. Uh, Zhongwen, China writing system. Zhongguoren, a citizen of China. Hanzu, it's someone of Han lineage. Uh, Zhangzu is someone of Tibetan lineage. Weizu is someone of Uyghur lineage. And Mongguzu is someone of Mongolian lineage. And then there are uh, countless of others that are different Zhu, different lineages within China. There are 56 officially recognized uh, nationalities in China. Okay, so I've defined Chinese and defined China. Uh, now I'm defining Xinjiang itself. Uh, the first character is Xin. Uh, which means new. Jiang is the second character, meaning frontier or domain. Xinjiang, uh, this means the new dominion or the new frontier. Uh, this is the, the, the term that's been used in China since 1878. Before 1878, Xinjiang did not exist. So I'm talking about this because we're talking about pre, we're talking about 
pre-Islamic Taklamakan Desert. And it's very easy to want to say, in China's far west in Xinjiang, back in 660, um, there was a, like a lot of there were a lot of Buddhists in such and such a city. Because you can't you you really can't say that because China didn't exist, Xinjiang didn't exist, and um, even Chinese. If you you talk about Chinese anything, that really didn't exist prior to 1878, or prior to during the period in question. So Xinjiang, before 1878, was known as Xi, meaning the West, and Yi, meaning regions. Um, the Western region, <clears throat> this isn't talking about a singular place. Uh, Xinjiang today, the new dominion, that is a singular place. But when we talk about Xi Yi, Prior to 1878, this is not one place, but rather it's an amalgam of different kingdoms that were located to the west of the central states. So we have the central states to the east, and then to the west of the central states were the western regions, the Xi Yi. Um, the western regions consisted of places both inside and outside of contemporary Xinjiang. So Xinjiang is a very massive place. Uh, it wasn't a unitary place uh, prior to 1878. There were different peoples who lived in different places. Um, it wasn't the Uyghurs of, of the western regions uh, prior to the 20th century, really. There were different peoples who lived in different places with different governments, they had kings, they had um, empires, they had honnets. So I'm going to just talk really briefly about uh, Zungaria because um, this is an, a region of interest to me and it's also of some importance to understanding the southern part of Xinjiang, which we're going to focus on. Uh, Zungaria it comes from Mongolian, uh, meaning from Zun and Gar. Uh, Zun means left, Gar means hand. Um, this was a territory that was controlled by Mongolians. And if you look at a map of China, Mongolia is right here. To the left of Mongolia is Zungaria. This used to be a Mongolian region. Uh, up until the time that the Manchus conquered this, this area. So uh, there was actually an official Western Mongolian, the Zungar Khanate, located in Zungaria uh, during the 17th and 18th century. It took about until 1758 for the Qing to conquer and practically uh, to practically eradicate the Zungarian people. They were uh, Mongol nomads, and there was a fairly effective genocide campaign against the uh, Zungars during the 18th century. Uh, they were Tibetan Buddhist background. Okay, now talking about the Tarim Basin to the south. Uh, the Tarim Basin is dominated by the Taklamakan Desert, which is this massive, massive, if you look at the pictures in the book, massive desert. It's very barren, uh, very few living things, uh, either plants or animal life. Very little can survive there. <clears throat> that being said, people did survive in the Tarim Basin. Uh, in the local language, uh, at least the contemporary local language of Uyghur, uh, it's known as the Altashakha. Uh, and it's often written imperfectly as Altashar in English. Uh, Altashar means six Alta Shehe cities. So the six cities. And as you can see, at the very center we have the Taklamakan Desert. And then these red dots represent population centers. Uh, so the six cities are all along these 
these populated areas just on the outskirts of the uh, Taklamakan Desert. Um, the six cities, it depends on who you're talking, it depends who you're talking with, exactly the identities of these six cities. Different people will say different, uh, different six cities. Um, it's, there's no real agreement between different scholarly sources what the six cities refer to, because there are more than six cities. There are more than six oases within this massive desert. The desert, the cities in the desert are watered with runoff from, you notice all this brown area, this is all uh, mountain areas, uh, it's runoff, or it, it's watered with runoff from the Kunlun to the south, the uh, Karakoram to the southwest, the Pamirs to the west, and the Tian Shan to the north. <clears throat> Um, one thing that's important to know about the Alta Shehera, uh, while these six cities, or what, the, the desert oases, they had similarities in terms of culture, and um, they have some similarities in regards to hit and culture, uh, but at the same time, uh, they have very different histories. They're not historically united. So uh, this brings me to the Uyghurs. Uh, Uyghurs are the, are the inhabitants of the historical Alta Shehera, the current Tarim Basin. Uh, they're also the, the namesake for the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Um, they were only defined, though, as Uyghurs under the, uh, the nationalities policies of the contemporary People's Republic of China. People before that time, they would have either identified generically as Turks. A lot of people would identify as Turks because they are uh, Turkic speakers. They speak a language that's more related to Turkish than to Chinese. Um, so they're, they're, they're a lot more similar in terms of language to Central Asian stands, uh, to Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan than they are to Chinese. There's some Chinese borrowed words, but grammatically, uh, there's no similarity. Um, another thing to know about contemporary Uyghurs is that they're primarily Muslim. Okay, so the historical Silk Road. Um, right here is Xinjiang, and here is the central states. Uh, this is China's interior. If you notice, uh, Silk Road paths often took traders through the territories that we know, now know as Xinjiang, through these western regions. So there are different paths that people would take uh, to get goods from China all the way to, or from the central states, uh, you need to get those goods to the west, to Rome, to the Greek states. The name Silk Road, uh, first of all, it's not talking, these aren't really very exact maps. Um, there wasn't actually a road that was called, this is the Silk Road. That's a later coinage by the German explorer Ferdinand von Richthofen. And the Silk Road was not a place where only silk was traded. There were a lot of other goods traded along the Silk Road, as well as an exchange of ideas. So you have the introduction via the Silk Road, you have the introduction to China um, of Buddhism, and Islam, Christianity, a lot of early faiths made their way across the Silk Road um, and into to China, and the other way around. Uh, ideas would go from China to the West.
the cities of the Taklamakan Desert uh, during this movement. Uh, these are uh, during the on the trade routes across the Silk Road. Um, the cities would be stopping points for traders. 